um, academia is an online uh, social ecological academy. Academia's aim is to support individuals and communities that are working to, uh, to, to support their communities and those who are working uh, for the planet. Academia aspires to build a bridge between and connect um, uh, people from the northern and southern hemisphere through cooperation, collaboration, and educational programs by uh, bringing ideas, concepts, and models and, um, and, and examples together. We hope to inspire a dialogue and build bridges between communities and individuals and disciplines, different disciplines. Academia also offers scholarship to indigenous people, activists, refugees, and those who can, uh, that cannot afford it. Uh, for further information, I uh, uh, ask you to check the website of Academia. Today, our um, uh, speaker, Suzanne, as I have said, uh, Suzanne is an um, uh, Emeritus Professor of Architectural Engineering uh, at Harriet Watts University in Edinburgh. She is an award-winning author, architect, and solar in energy pioneer, uh, driven by her commitment to combat climate change through better design and um, better design. Her research has covered uh, the wind catchers, to the traditional Middle Eastern technologies, and nomadic architecture in Iran, Mesopotamian, Mesopotamian archaeology, photovoltaics, low carbon, passive and solar, and adaptive. Uh, adaptive, resilient, and sustainable design, and thermal comfort. Her 22 books include Eco House, a design guide, adapt, uh, design guide, adapting buildings and cities for climate change, closing the loop, benchmarks for sustainable buildings and energy efficient buildings, adaptive thermal comfort, and the ice houses of Britain. She was an Oxford City Councillor, a board member on the UK Architect. Architects Registration Board at Ruskin College, Oxford. She is a, a non-executive director of AES, Solar Energy LTD, and managing director of the EcoHouse Initiative LTD. Her current activities and interests cover the history of Scottish Mechanics Institute, uh, and a resilient design, design for extreme climates, carbon accounting, and the link between COVID and ventilation. Uh, she chaired a PLE 2017 conference promoting natural energy buildings, has co-chaired the Windsor Conference on Comfort 19, 19, from 1994 to 2020, and the Comfort at the Extremes uh, Conference in Dubai in 2019. She's the Architectural Association Trustee for the Michael uh, Venturis Award from 1986 to present, and has sat of, uh, on the boards of five other charities. In 2020, she was awarded the prestigious, prestigious International uh, Farabi Award for Iranian Studies. She lectures internationally, is an expert advisor in the field of energy and buildings to organize in the U to organizations in the US, Austria, New Zealand, Norway, and Italy. Thank you, Suzanne, for joining us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. Now, each of us, in our lives that have brought us to where we are today, have traveled various um, pathways and now I'm presenting here, I've got to get this right, haven't I? Minimize. Yes. yes. Phew. Sorry, I'm um, maximize, uh, escape. Sorry, um, I was fiddling with my slides, which is always a big mistake. Yes, I'd like to I'd like to talk to you about thermal comfort, which is at the heart of regional and what I think is good design. My own doctorate was on the wind catchers of Yazd, this absolutely wonderful city in the deserts of Iran. Now, wind catcher is a tower built above the homes of desert in this desert city and it takes the very hot air 38 40 degrees centigrade 45 degrees centigrade channels it down a large tower where it's cooled and 
loses four or five degrees centigrade in that passage and people sit in this summer room facing away from the sun into the courtyard and, and get cool air cooling them around about 30, 32. But in the afternoons, they descend into these deep basements that might be 10 degrees centigrade cooler than outside. So an ordinary Yazdi housewife will be working in the courtyard right up until 12 o'clock at the daytime. And then the family descends into that lovely cool basement for lunch and a good sleep after lunch and emerges outside and it's 35, 36, up to 38 in the evenings. But because it's a, an understood pathway through the computer, um, people are perfectly comfortable at these higher temperatures, 35. When I was doing my PhD, my supervisor called me either mad or brilliant because what I found about the people in Yaz being comfortable at 36, 38, he said was fighting against all the findings of world experts on thermal comfort. I just said to him, look, I'm just telling the truth. This is how it is. But what the experts then said and have said for la about the last half century um, about comfort zones, those temperatures that people can be comfortable in. And here you see for 1941 to 2008 in winter and in summer in Japan and in America are the comfort zones that are regulated for. This is what the experts say people are comfortable at. And so for winter, you'll get from, um, in America, you get um, comfort zones, recent comfort zones from 20 to 24 and recently in summer they say the maximum comfortable temperature you can have is about 26. So for instance ASHRAE, the American Heating and Ventilating and Air Conditioning Society says that people actually can only be comfortable at 20 to 26 degrees centigrade. ASHRAE, the HEVAC um, industry body, writes the thermal comfort regulations and standards for America and has largely dictated thermal comfort standards around the world. And just to reiterate, they say people can only be comfortable between 20 and 26 degrees centigrade. Now, these HEVAC standards are measures of comfort um, based on a heat balance method um, for instance, you might be uh, familiar with the PMV standard. These are established using an algorithm involving four basic physical parameters and two assumed levels of clothing and activity. So you've got humidity, air speed, air temperatures, and radiant temperatures as the physical measures. And then you'll have metabolic rates and clothing insulation. So when people are designing buildings, they simply take those measures in the um, given algorithm um, to produce um, uh, estimations of whether these predicted conditions in a building will produce comfort between 20 and 26 degrees centigrade. And these measures are largely based on research done in laboratories in the USA and Northern Europe. And for the PMV, it was largely based on the algorithms based on work done in the 50s to the 70s, although it's been, you know, periodically updated. And it's usually, it was usually done with college age students, usually white college age students in laboratory settings whose responses were measured and then felt fed into the normalized standards. So that's the EVAC approach to air conditioning. And these standards like the international standard EN ISO 7730, not only locks you into having to have air conditioning or heating or ventilating systems because of those standards, it also then very cleverly tells people and clients in particular 
that an office to be an A-class office, say we take the, the summer season here, must be able to achieve a temperature of 4.5 plus or minus 0.5, which means sort of a 4.4 to 5 um, degrees centigrade, uh, sorry, 4 to, 4 to 5 centigrade in the office all the time when people are in it. That's an A-grade office. The narrower the comfort zones, the more HVAC equipment you need and therefore can be sold. And the very narrow limited winter and summer comfort zones in class A offices, first class offices, need even more efficient AC equipment and therefore more expensive equipment. So the HVAC industry who writes the regulations, writes them in such a way that clients are pushed into um, thinking that if they want a good office building, they have to have really expensive HVAC in it because the B um, standard, which is a sort of second class or also RAM, um, and the C office, which actually allows you much more flexibility of temperatures, you can have plus or minus 2.5, which means that technically you can open the windows under some conditions. So a C standard office is a naturally ventilated or ve naturally ventilatable office. An A standard building, you need fixed windows you can't open the windows so you've got thin tight skin buildings um, and clients presented who want to do best for their the people who buy the buildings or occupy them who will be pushed into making trust between an a building or a c building so the standards and the way they're presented push people into closed window highly um highly controlled buildings which um, is a problem. Why does it matter? Because every one degree difference between indoor set points and outdoor temperature requires between something like eight to 10% more energy to achieve. So if, for instance, in San Francisco, you set the heating set point at 22, which many buildings are set at for, for summer, the HVAC energy savings, when it's perhaps 28 outside or even 30 degrees centigrade outside, you can save 65 to 70%. And if you, if you set the HVAC set point at 28, or you allow the building to ro roll up to 28 in terms of its internal temperatures, you're saving 60% of the summer energy cooling you need. And, and in winter, you can, in San Francisco, you can say 40%. Obviously, for different climates, the difference between the set point and the outside temperature will be different. So you can have different amounts of savings. But every single degree that you're saving, you're saving 10% of the energy used. So you can save five, um, you know, uh, 50, 60% of that. Listen, we will always need heating and ventilating, um, especially in a world with more extreme temperatures. But isn't it sensible to use it only when the buildings need to be heated or cooled? But there is huge pressure because, of course, the sales of um, air conditioning systems are soaring all around the world as we're getting not only hotter weather but we're also having the standards pushing people into having you know shutting the windows because you can't achieve the standards if you have the windows open in in offices right so you've got the standards pushing people to fix window highly air-conditioned buildings and you also um have the the increasing heat of conditions um, pushing people into installing more air conditioning. So they're, they're on a win-win trajectory but there. But the trouble is, the warmer the indoor temperatures with rising temperatures, the more AC you use, and therefore the more energy you use and the more greenhouse gas emissions. 
is driving that vicious AC cycle. And there's the other, the other problem too, which is people suffer from extreme cold discomfort in buildings around the world, from Singapore to America. The Gulf is extremely bad conditions here because they think it, it's posher to have lower temperatures indoors. But that means the difference between the outdoor temperature, which might be 50 in um, Qatar here, uh, and then you're walking into a building that's 20, and you're getting extreme cold discomfort and health health implications because air conditioned buildings have been shown to be much less healthy than naturally ventilated ones. And overcooling is wasting in in the USA in 2012. It wasted. 104,000 gigawatt hours costing about 10 billion US dollars just to buy overcooling buildings. And if you look at the www.kate2021.com, there's some terrific papers in that, the Comfort at the Extremes conference that's just been held in Oman. In the 1980s, I found the adaptive thermal comfort model or the method because Thermal comfort is a state of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment. And, and that's actually a, an ASHRAE definition. So it's about how you feel about the temperature you're occupying, which produces a comfort response. And a lot of early work was done in Britain at the BRE between the 1930s and 60s, showing that people are perfectly comfortable in different places, in different climates around the world, between they, the, their studies then um, found them between 38, uh, sorry, 17 and 38. This is Baghdad, where I lived for many years, or in England. Um, you had people comfortable at lower temperatures in Baghdad or Rocky or India, much higher temperatures. But these are locally adapted people who are comfortable in the buildings in which these large sample data sets were collected. and. The leaders of the adaptive thermal comfort model were Fergus Nicoll, who in 1972 published this diagram, which shows that comfort is actually a dynamic feedback system of voluntary and involuntary action. So involuntary, you shiver, you sweat, your vasodilatory system works, etc. The voluntary actors, actions are you change your clothes, you open a window, um, or you change activities, etc. Michael Humphreys made this really important breakthrough where he, this is the neutral temperature or the comfort temperature of people in all of these um, surveys. And it was quite simply found, I mean, this is no, a no brainer in a way, that comfort indoor, indoor comfort temperatures track outdoor temperatures. So the hotter the climate you live in, the, the higher your comfort temperature. Um, it's a no-brainer, really, but people were horrified, um, especially the air conditioning industry who simply didn't believe this diagram. It can't be true. They weren't really comfortable. You know, the sort of... The adaptive principle, which those two evolved, was that people adapt to those temperatures that they normally occupy. And if they're uncomfortable, they act to restore comfort. It's simple enough. And the way you, you develop thermal comfort studies is you, you ask real people in real buildings how they feel. You measure the physical parameters and, and then the parameters like clothing and activity with interviews to find out how comfortable they feel. So you note the controls as the window open or the blinds down. You measure the environment. You ask them how they're feeling, hot, warm, and comfortable is slightly warm, slightly cool, neutral, cool, cold. And you know what they're wearing and you ask them how they feel. And that gives us the really um, now very um, robust adaptive limits to comfort. Sorry. Um, and people, again, can data collected as fed into new international and a national adaptive thermal comfort standards like ASHRAE 55 2004. 
you know, I came back from living a really rather interesting life. This is me excavating with my husband and baby in northern Iraq in 1985 through the cold and the heat. This is when I lived with nomads in Luristan um, on long migrations, two long migrations with them. These people who had nothing lived happy, comfortable lives. And after 10 years living in remote Iran and Iraq with peoples whose lifestyles would be hit first and worst by climate change, I asked when I returned, why is change not happening? What's wrong? I did what I could. I built the first solar roof in the UK on my own eco home. Gradually, it became clear that the reason why change wasn't happening was that there, there these very large um, entrenched bodies who controlled the standards and the way the building industry developed. And chief amongst them is ASHRAE, uh, the American heating, uh, refrigeration and air conditioning engineers. And this is a copy of their first constitution in 1895, which mandated that standards be used to push people into using their products. See here, this is their 1895 constitution. They, they declared they would establish clearly defined minimum standard of heating ventilation for all classes of buildings and then push legislation compelling ventilation of all building, of all public buildings to be in accordance with the standards of this society. So they set the standards and then they influence and lobby for the, the legal basis on a, internationally, country by country, to ensure that people had to design according to their standards, right? So they were basically sewing up the markets, which they did brilliantly and created some great buildings and some great engineers as well. But the world I came back to was changing because just as those springs for the nomads were drying up on the migrations, I came back into a world beginning to understand the challenge of climate change. We had the Rio conference in 1992. And the world hadn't changed that much then. There were still choices possible and decisions to be made. This, for instance, is Sheikh Zayed Road in Dubai in 1991, 30 years ago. This is Las Vegas in 1990. This is London in 1995. It didn't have to go the way it did. In the 1990s, early 92, we knew that air-conditioned buildings used far more energy. And this is for the UK. This is the SIBSI Econ 19. So a traditional, naturally ventilated, pretty heavyweight English office was compared to a 1960s open plan, lightweight, more highly glazed, but still naturally ventilated office type two. And then you got into the thin, tight skin buildings, fully air conditioned. This is a typical one. And then you get into the prestige air conditioned buildings, you know, the class A buildings. And this would be a class B building, probably. And uh, this is sort of 1992, in that you could see that, for instance, for the CO2, it, these big prestigious buildings emit four or five times more than an ordinary naturally ventilated one. They cost more to run. They use more energy. And we knew that way back then. So why didn't the regulations intelligently push people to build more buildings that were low energy, low emissions, and uh, low cost? Back in 1991, we knew about embodied energy. We knew this is a very good study by Trelaw, Fay et al. in 2001. We knew that the higher the building is, the more energy it takes per meter square to build it. 
But the headlong rush around the world was towards high and super high energy buildings. New York then in 1991, Buenos Aires, and this is Oman in 1991, but any city you go to, if you go to Buenos Aires, you can tell just by looking at the building, which decade it was written, it was built in, 1950, 1960, 1910, 1980, 2000, 1980, getting more and more thin, tight skin, more highly glazed. And yet, in the 1950s, the 1920s, the 1980s even, we were looking at this sort of building. I mean, we'd come from the regional vernacular. So cities around the world had their own particular um, building types, whether it was offices or homes or schools or whatever. But then we got the international style, the mid fifties, the dream of nuclear energy, energy too cheap to meter. High energy buildings were increasingly actively pushed by developer pressure, by energy efficiency regulations. And what's really even more horrific in the 2000s by green and sustainable uh, rating schemes. That's the real um, tragedy. So suddenly within 20 years, we went from ordinary cities to the super high energy building cities. We went from vernacular buildings that survived without grid energy to buildings that cannot survive when the power fails, when the grid goes down. I mean, and you can see how standards push this. You get a good article by Cass and Chauve and so on. And then you get to the real horrors of the, the noughties, the the 20, the, the lead platinum buildings, and they call them the greenest energy buildings you can get. Laugh out loud. These are horrific buildings. It's, there was no need to improve the architectural buildings, uh, design of these buildings at all to get lead platinum rating. In fact, you couldn't get lead platinum if it was a naturally ventilated building. It was just um, the only way to get lead platinum was to put in more expensive air conditioning. And the lead rating scheme was funded and led by the carrier air conditioning um, company through, the, um, through its marketing and environmental manager. And now if you read Edna Shaviv in PLEA, you, it just says, you know, um, low energy, a passive and low energy architecture versus green architecture. And she just clearly demonstrates that the only way you could get platinum for lead was very expensive air conditioning. And then you had all of the, the credibility gap, you know, you had the, the BRIAM rating schemes, which Britain exported because the privatized building research establishment could make money out of them. It exported them around the world, just as lead was exported to India, to the Gulf and to everywhere else. Um, but suddenly people were discovering that the BRIAM estimate for a, you know, fancy building bore no resemblance to actually the emissions from that building two years on, because, of course, the people doing the ratings want to persuade their clients that they've got a really green building. So they put in their assumptions about how it's going to be used and what's going to happen, which bear no um, relationship to the reality of how the building is used. And if you look at those econ typical benchmarks, um, you know that that the, they are not even good benchmarks. These buildings that are supposed to be um, the greenest. This is this was the greenest office block in London. It's just basically the most heavily greenwashed building. And look, 30 years on from that photo of the three Hilton Hotel Towers, this is Sheikh Zayed Road. Just imagine if people had had consciences then, had intelligently pushed people into green buildings 
genuinely green buildings, how very different this would have been and how very much more resilient it would have been. Because of course, you've got about half an hour to get out of that building when the grid fails be before it starts to super overheat. Um, so, I mean, God knows what you do in, in some of these towers when the grid goes down. These are very fragile cities and cities where, you know, in the 20 years ago, they'd be 48 degrees centigrade. They're now getting to 50, 52 degrees centigrade in summer. So we had to fight back. Um, and here is, um, I don't know, there's Fergus Nicol. We've got Mike Humphreys here. We've got Bjorn Orlison. Um, and we started conferences in 1994 at Windsor. And by 2018, which is the last time we could actually um, meet, there were 11 Windsor conferences um, working to understand how real people feel thermally in real buildings. These are experts from Japan, from China, from Europe, from Australia, from America, from around the world. And we have changed um, the standards together. You have to stand shoulder to shoulder in these sort of things. And I mean, if you want to find out more about it, I mean, we've done books on, on this, which you can follow up. Fergus Humphreys, uh, so Michael Humphreys, Fergus, Nicole and I, um, and also some of my other books. Uh, but I want to explain to you quite clearly, it's been a long road and we've fully carefully, get, we've followed it carefully. Um, so in 19, the, North, the 1990s was about energy efficient buildings. And it's sort of, that's basically the passive house standard. That's 20th century thinking. A bit more insulation, better windows, no cold bridging, draft proofing, etc. cetera. Um, by the noughties, I mean, this is my eco house book. It's like four, four editions of that. That's actually talking about good resilient design because I put all the lessons from Iran and Iraq, the traditional buildings into that for, for like anticipating climate change, how to keep safe in buildings. 2004 was about um, sustainable buildings. It, this is the benchmarks of sustainable buildings. And I wrote this book. But I personally think sustainability is virtually greenwashing. How do you compare an energy efficient light bulb with a cycle rack or a, a water butt? Or, um, you know, it's impossible to compare apples and pears. So we lost a decade pursuing sustainability. Um, and suddenly the climate doo-doos were beginning to hit the fan and people started worrying about adapting buildings and cities for climate change. And it's frightening if you, you actually look at it. But so we were learning the lessons as we went. So the, the teens has been about resilience. I think the 20s, so we've got energy efficiency, the 20th century, we've got sustainability, the noughties, lost decade. The teens are about resilience. And I think we're now into extreme design. But one point is that people didn't care about this. People completely unwilling. And this is a, a thing I did in 2004. People completely unwilling to face the reality of climate change. Buildings increasingly fail as the global temperatures go up. Communities fail infrastructure here's the arab spring in cairo infrastructures this is um two months ago in oman infrastructures failed and system capacities are exceeded this is lake mead which feeds uh, las vegas much of california it's down to now um the thousand foot intake which is the one below which the electricity generation for those regions um, ceases to be viable. And so we're down, Lake Mead's now down around the thousand foot intake. The system's, you know, capacity is exceeded. So we have to build more resilient buildings, more resilient communities, new paradigms for infrastructure. And we have to start doing capacity planning and resource allocation systematizing. I tell you something though, 
people are much more willing when extreme weather events affect themselves, right? So this is Seattle. This is the heat dome of July 2021, where, you know, lots and lots of people died in their own homes in North America because they didn't know it was coming. This is Germany. The huge impacts of the floods this year are there. This is um, Houston. So you've got a, a, an ice storm in Houston, and then the whole grid fails because of the local corruption in the, the actual electricity generation and distribution system in the state. People begin to get it when that happens. So this is our next book, which is coming out in April, um, which is resilient, the Routledge Handbook of Resilient Thermal Comfort. And it's got some astounding stuff in it. Um, effective strategies for building resilience and heating well. And, you know, you can look at this at your will, but comfort and trust, COVID and ventilation. Um, 34 chapters, defining problems, explaining research and providing usable solutions. Um, chapter one shows how Fergus Nichols shows how people, real people actually perceive temperatures in the buildings they occupy. It changes according to what the geography of a region is. Even if it's the same culture, this is Pakistan. Cities in different climates within Pakistan have very different air temperatures that people occupy. Um, people in different climates are comfortable at different temperatures at different times of year. They adapt. Um, and so here's one city in Pakistan, Multan, where people are, are quite happy at 35. And here's another where people are quite happy in um, Seydou Sharif up in the mountains, um, living in 15 degrees centigrade. Here is really important for you at Ecademia. Comfort is a cultural phenomenon. It's shaped by climate and culture. So these were all the cities in Pakistan over a year, naturally ventilated buildings. But look at this, France has a different comfort culture to anywhere else in Europe. You look in summer, these are naturally ventilated buildings. As the temperatures rise, people open the windows in France. And as it gets colder, they below, and it's quite low temperatures, below about 15 degrees centigrade, they turn the heating on. That's in France. So it's bimodal, naturally ventilated in summer, heated in winter. In Portugal, it's, they naturally ventilate all year. So basically, it's a hotter country, so they sort of suck it up in winter and put a little local heater in the room they're sitting in, but they're largely naturally ventilated all year. In Sweden, it's completely different. The HEVAC in Sweden, they keep their buildings between 20 and 25 all year. There isn't a summer, there isn't a winter indoors for them. It's because they are culturally attuned to having... Um, highly uh, heated and cooled buildings, right? So how research is done in, how is research done in Sweden, yeah, relevant to the thermal experiences in Portugal or Pakistan? What right has the cold north to impose their standards on the warm south? So you see what we've got here, we've got largely the ASHRAE standards or the international standards of what people ought to do based on research done in Sweden, in Denmark, in air-conditioned laboratories in America. They're completely out of sync with what temperatures people feel comfortable in, in France or Pakistan or even Britain, which is a bit of a basket case. So that was just the first chapter in the book. Um, and here we've got, you might know the work of Lisa Heschong, who, oh no, sorry, this is Marcel Schweiker from Switzerland, uh, and sorry, from Germany. He, and he's just saying, look, buildings, we have to rethink it. We, we don't look at neutrality 
we design for adaptive opportunities, let people choose what temperatures they want to occupy or can afford to occupy. Let's design buildings for enjoyment and delight. Doing that quite simply leads to increased human resist resilience, higher human satisfaction and decreased energy use. So higher human building resilience. And here's Lisa Hershon, who wrote that famous book, D Thermal Delight in Architecture. She just says, look, the interfaces we design, um, the occupant behavioral savings generally depend on whether people can use the interfaces. Their research is present presented in the book, classifying in interfaces by their impact. But a switch, a more complex one, even more complex and more complex. And it looks at the negative and positive impacts of moving from a simple switch to a complex one. And if you can't, so designers really need to start assessing the overheating in their buildings that they, um, without any heating or cooling in a naturally ventilated mode, the, the overheating hours can be categorized according to their intensity and frequency and therefore the overheating risks assessed. And if it's got too high a risk of overheating, then you change the basic design. You uh, make it more um, resilient to high temperatures. And um, the old folks in old folks' homes um, are really particularly vulnerable. So chapter seven here for Adelaide, where they've had very bad heat waves. Um, this is a very good one on how do you assess human resilience? And they've got advice to older people on thermal comfort, well-being, and health. So that's a useful chapter. Overheating in schools, the other vulnerable group, the young people, and they show that what you really have to do is rather than put in more and more air conditioning as extreme events happen, you have to put in more and more passive measures right at the beginning of the design. And then you have to teach teachers and students about supporting adaptive behaviors and informing them too. Um, and then looking at uh, really wonderful studies in Abuja, Nigeria, how simple uh, modification of standard roof construction and air conditioning and um, can have huge impacts on the numbers of sleeping hours and bedroom temperatures. And um, local regulations should incorporate such strategies, do such studies and incorporate such strategies to reduce reliance on air conditioning locally. So the advice for a township like this in Nigeria will be very different from Sudan, for instance, where um, the devolution of thermal resilience in residential houses. So rather than making the traditional homes were quite robust in the face of overheating, whereas nowadays they're just shutting the, the modern houses off, 14% of the population of Sudan lives in Khartoum. 70% of all the electricity in the country is used by this majority. And um, only 44% have any access to electricity in the country. And she says there's a critical need to build affordable modern houses to reduce cooling loads and reliance on AC, incorporating vernacular strategies and techniques to reduce cooling loads. New vernacular sat solutions have to have the best of both worlds. So saying that, you know, that basically every individual town and city must um, have their own solutions, not import absolutely inappropriate international standards. So cool cities projects, this is in Ipo in Malaysia, and they showed how using planting strategies and looking at the heat island effect and tackling heating problems bit by bit across the city, they were able to significantly improve the comfort of people in those um, in that city. In Tokyo, um, and a, a detailed 
um, adaptive thermal comfort standards in homes and offices means that now for, for instance, in Tokyo, they know exactly what temperatures people open their windows at. They know how much clothing they're wearing with different outdoor temperatures. They know the proportion of heating usage so that the heating's completely turned off by about 20, de 20 degrees centigrade and the proportion of cooling use. So um, Homri Jal, who also co-edits this book with us, is now doing a, an adaptive comfort um, study like this of every major city across the different regions in Japan to establish adaptive thermal comfort standards that are locally appropriate. And this big new thing is that um, going for mixed mode buildings. So even if you've got full air conditioning, you have to be able to open the windows as well for many different reasons. Um, thermal comfort's higher, energy usage is much lower, and people are healthy, simply healthier in these mixed mode buildings. And if you want to know how COVID has affected buildings, um, this excellent chapter is outlines the need for new thinking on building ventilation to stop the indoor spread of COVID. Because if you have fixed build window buildings, you get far higher um, rates of COVID spread internally than simply by opening the windows. Um, so she says flexibility is key. You have to be able to open the windows and it might be that you want to close them sometimes too. The future has to be different. I think these are dead end buildings. I think these are dead end cities. And um, the easy step for designers and property developers who are pushing this is to, um, is to go this way. This is where they make the money. The difficult step is to work out the next generation of passive and resilient buildings. What are they going to look like? How are they going to be run? And to give you an example of how thermal comfort standards have chronically affected whole countries and cultures, this is Gorgayan near New Delhi, a new town. These are the new buildings in this new town. Many have green lead rating systems. These are the worst types of buildings in the world for the climate, for the planet, and yet they're promoted what if India had had its own real green design codes? What if they had gone for genuinely low energy buildings? I mean, this is Ashok Lal. He's a Delhi architect who does the most wonderful, you know, high density, um, naturally ventilated and also cooled buildings. Because natural ventilation we must have buildings that for as much of the year as possible can be run on free local energy rather than grid energy. What happened if India had had its own real green design codes? We would have got some beautiful buildings like the Krishni Bahav, um, Bahavan government buildings in Orissa designed by Studio Lotus. And this trend is happening all around the world. This is Kampong Admiralty Building in Singapore by the wonderful Warha Architects. Would the lights have gone out um, at the hottest time of year as they did in July 2020, when more than 620 million people, about 9% of the world's population, were without grid power across 22 states of Northern India for one to four or five days. The lights were put out simply by those high energy buildings that peaked at the hottest time of year. Because we must always keep an eye on the fact that in an extreme future, nobody is safe until everybody is safe. We learned that from COVID. 40% of electricity emissions globally come from some buildings. And these are the buildings, the high energy buildings. 
objects they come from, occupied by these people, the top 10, 5% of people around the world are driving those 40% of the electricity emissions. They are not occupied by these people in Europe who cannot afford to keep their homes adequately warm in 2016. Bulgaria, 40% of the population couldn't afford to keep warm enough in their own homes. So that electricity emissions are not driven by them and they're not driven by people in these buildings. They're driven by high, high energy people. So the time has come to demand comfort justice. Tell that to the corporations and their bankers and their politicians. This is David Cameron who wrote, corruption is one of the greatest enemies of progress of our times. It is a cancer at the heart of so many of the world's problems. He was caught lobbying for green cell capital. He was a corrupt prime minister, just as we have now a fairly incredibly untruthful prime minister. Sarkozy, president of France, sentenced to prison. Evergrande, I mean, it goes on and on at the heart of why the world is overheating is that corruption and at the heart of that corruption is an approach to comfort which is no longer sustainable and the voters are beginning to tire of it. Look, read, read these um, points at your leisure. Rem I mean, this is my advice. We have to remove vested interests from the building development processes. Replace international thermal comfort standards with national and probably regional adaptive comfort standards. Um, and for a start, remove nationally, uh, planning permission committees nationally, fund, fund them and remove perverse incentives um, that, la that fund local planning departments into re in relation to how large the developments are they, um, they, they promote and allow and exclude people with vested property interests from sitting on planning committees. I mean, in the city of London now, in a city where there is no demand for office space, we've got over a hundred new glass towers planned and on the planning committees for those are people who make their living from selling commercial property space. Natural energy buildings mandate low energy buildings, refuse, refuse planning permission for all high energy buildings, except in ex exceptional circumstances, mandate that all buildings must have at least 25% opening windows, mandate that all buildings must have building integrated solar systems where possible so they can be run on local solar and preferably dispatchable so that when the grid goes down, they've still got solar generation and batteries. Ban public buildings from using green, greenwashing green and sustainable rating schemes. Mandate solar, mandate opening windows, ban high energy buildings. Is that so difficult? Um, natural energy cities, um, and again, there's a lot of um, a lot of advice there on doing that. And in the end, uh, I predict that in 20 years, our cities will be short, will shrink, shrinking cities. They'll be shorter. Um, the footprints. This is Berlin, which is very intelligently in the planning. Um, laws, they ensure that the rooms, all the rooms in the building are able to be naturally ventilated and naturally daylit. Um, so thinner building footprints and outlaw 
laundrette developers stop laundering money um, through these appalling developments, which are happening all around the world. If you think it's bad now, wait until 2030. This was the 2003 heat wave. 72,000 people died in one heat wave across Europe. By 2050, that will be a cool year. We are the experts now. So let us call for comfort, justice for all. No more blah, blah, blah. Radical change is essential and comfort is at the heart of it. Thank you very much.